Peptides are blowing up, and we need to talk about why. Hey everyone, I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today we're talking peptides. If you spend just like 10 minutes on health or weight loss or fitness TikTok, you will see countless videos about the miraculous world of peptides. From skin to gut health, fat loss, and post-workout recovery, peptides are officially the biohack of the year. But peptides actually are not anything new. They are simply short chains of amino acids that make up more complex proteins and include everything from insulin to ozempic to oxytocin. But today we are going to be diving into some of the hot new peptides to enter the villa, the good, the bad, and the basically illegal. But first, a quick little note from my sponsor. Friends, I am so excited to share today's sponsor with you. Let's talk about Nourish. One of the biggest hurdles I hear about from so many of you is how hard it can be to find a registered dietitian who actually accepts your insurance. And that's exactly why I love recommending Nourish. Here's the thing. A lot of people don't realize this, but there is a big difference between a nutritionist and a registered dietitian. RDs are regulated health professionals who must meet rigorous standards for education and provide evidence-based care. And Nourish makes it super simple to connect with a real dietitian and even better, they accept hundreds of insurance plans across all 50 states. In fact, 94% of their patients pay nothing out of pocket. Instead of generic one size fits all advice, Nourish Dietitians offer tailored nutrition therapy through flexible online sessions. Whether you're looking to manage your weight, recover from an eating disorder, navigate IBS, diabetes, pregnancy, or have other health concerns, they will match you with a dietitian who has the right expertise to support lasting lifestyle changes. And on top of that, the Nourish app makes the process super convenient. You can basically chat with your RD, track your symptoms, and manage your appointments all in one place. Honestly, I cannot recommend it enough. So if you are looking for personalized one-on-one -on -one dietitian support and want the process seamlessly covered by insurance, head to usenourish.com slash Abby's Kitchen to find the perfect RD for you. Okay, friends, a really fast disclaimer that I am a dietitian, I'm not a doctor or a pharmacist, so we are gonna be keeping things surface level today. Always speak to your doctor before trying any new medications, whether they are synthetic or naturally derived. Also, if you're into deep dives on trending nutrition topics, I would love if you would hit up my podcast, Bite Back with Abby Sharp. All right, kids, let's get into it. So first of all, we need to talk briefly about how drugs like peptides get FDA approved. Because spoiler alert, a lot of these just don't. To get FDA approval requires rigorous testing. So generally in vitro and animal testing, then human phase one, two, and three trials where safety, effective dosing, and side effects are determined. And if it passes all the tests, a pharmaceutical company can then apply for approval where all of the data is formally reviewed. But now let's talk peptides and you're gonna see where all of this ties in. So the first peptides we're gonna be talking about are BPC-157 and TB-500, which are commonly taken together as what is affectionately known as the Wolverine stack. Wolverine. Stacks, by the way, just refer to supplements or medications that are taken together for synergistic benefits. And you can honestly just scroll through Biohack Talk to hear about all of the alleged superhero powers of this particular stack. So BPC-157 is the first player in the Wolverine. It's a synthetic peptide that was derived from a protein in human stomach juice back in like 93 that is now being promoted for rapid healing, recovery, and even gut health by strengthening the gut lining. The research does show some promising results for tissue healing in vitro and on rats, but for us humans, not so much. But even more problematically is that it's actually barely legal. 
but it is not approved by the FDA for clinical uses. It is not allowed to be used by compounding pharmacies and it's actually banned by sports regulatory agencies like the World Anti-Doping Agency and US Anti-Doping Agencies. So any athlete who is found to be using it will face serious consequences. Now, despite all of this, it is available online for research use only, even though you'll still find compounding pharmacies and many spas reselling it for human use. Now, at this time, BPC-157 is still in preclinical research phase. And while there has been one phase one clinical trial done, the results haven't even been published yet. So we are basically playing a guessing game based on rat physiology, which doesn't generally inspire a ton of confidence in me. And although toxicity effects haven't been reported, we still don't know much about safe use in humans, which is particularly important with these pro-angiogenic agents that could theoretically also promote tumor growth. But now let's talk about TB500. So TB500 is also a synthetic peptide derived from a naturally occurring protein in human tissues that was originally used for performance enhancing effects in horse racing. Are we horses? No. But alas, it doesn't stop many spas and wellness clinics from selling it with the promise that it can help to accelerate healing, support joints, improve cardiovascular health, and stimulate hair growth. But like its Wolverine brother peptide, TB500 also exists in a regulatory gray zone. Banned in professional sports, not FDA approved, and very limited research on humans. None of which even supports the claims I just mentioned. So the bottom line for the Wolverine stack is that we have very limited research on its use in humans, and you should definitely avoid it if you are a competitive athlete. Personally, I am nowhere close to being sold. And as we continue talking about these peptides, you're about to see a consistent pattern. Up next, we're gonna be talking retrotrutide. It is a hard word to say, so I'm just gonna call it ret ret. So ret ret falls somewhere into the category of GLP-1s and yay, we actually have some human research on it. Now, although RETRET isn't FDA approved yet, it's currently undergoing a phase three clinical trial scheduled for completion in early 2026. And data from the phase two clinical trial showed some super promising results of 24% weight loss in 48 weeks. For comparison, studies on semaglutide, AKA Ozempic, shows around a 15% weight loss, while tyrosepatide can be around 20 to 25%. So RET RET may very well be the next big weight loss injection. So let's quickly talk mechanisms. Ozempic mimics one hormone, GLP-1, but RET RET targets three, GLP-1, GIP, and glucagon. Both GLP-1 and GIP promote insulin release and slow gastric emptying, which helps with both blood sugar, satiety, and therefore weight loss. And then glucagon activation can increase fat breakdown and energy expenditure. Red Red is the most potent at the GIP receptor, but together it really works synergistically at the three different hormone receptors to modify appetite, increase insulin release, and support better blood sugars. Not unlike semaglutide though, it is not without side effects and up to 90% of participants taking it in the phase two trial experience side effects like nausea, vomiting, constipation, and diarrhea. And some also reported a lot of skin irritations and rashes. But overall, emerging research on RET RET does look very promising, but it's not fully FDA approved yet. And when it becomes FDA approved, I'm so excited for it to have a name that I can actually pronounce. But that also means that it's not allowed to be made in compounding pharmacies or on sale for human use yet. Although again, you will definitely find vendors selling it online for research and lab purposes. But until RET RET is FDA approved, we have no way of verifying the quality and safety of any of these kind of black market versions. So I always recommend speaking to your doctor about alternatives that you can try in the meantime. Okay, the last category of popular peptides that we'll be discussing are considered growth hormone secretagogues, which include sermorlin, tesamorlin, and ipamorlin. 
sound like three wicked stepsisters to me. These peptides essentially work to stimulate growth hormone, which then help to promote muscle growth, increase fat breakdown, and alter our glucose metabolism toward a more hyperglycemic state. Growth hormone also stimulates the release of IGF-1 from the liver, which may also help to promote muscle growth, bone health, and regulate our metabolism. That said, there are a ton of peptides that fit into this category. I'm just gonna give a very brief overview of some of the key players. So Sir Morlin is a peptide that was actually FDA approved for treating children with growth hormone deficiency, but it was discontinued in 2008 due to manufacturing difficulties. But despite that, Folks will still use it off-label for things like muscle growth, fat loss, libido, and even improved sleep. We do have some research for Sir Morlin's benefits in treating children with slowed growth, and we even have some promising results showing that it improved cognition in older adults and body composition in HIV patients who are experiencing lipodystrophy. I was also super intrigued to learn more about Sir Morlin's proposed role in improving sleep quality, especially the proportion of deep sleep. Now, right now we don't have any studies specifically investigating this, but theoretically it makes sense knowing that growth hormone is mainly released during those deep sleep periods. And we do have some research showing that growth hormone releasing hormone, which Sir Morlin actually mimics, can decrease wakefulness and increase our deep sleep. So we're getting close. Tessa Morlin, aka Egrifta, was also FDA approved, but specifically for helping to reduce excess abdominal fat in HIV patients who have lipodystrophy, where it has been shown to reduce visceral fat by 15 to 20% in 6 to 12 months and improve other metabolic health markers like blood sugars and blood lipids. But remember folks, this has only been studied in HIV positive patients, not healthy people just like looking to tone up. Tessa Morlin has also been studied in patients with type two diabetes and they showed no significant effect on blood sugar metrics after 12 weeks, which perhaps is actually a good thing because we do know that artificially high levels of growth hormone can often impair glucose tolerance. So this is really like a safety measure in my books. The last peptide we'll be talking about is ipamorelin. So unlike the other growth hormone secretagogues that we just discussed, ipamorelin doesn't mimic growth hormone releasing hormone. Instead, it actually mimics ghrelin, which you all may know as our hunger hormone because ghrelin also stimulates the release of growth hormone. And unfortunately, I'm gonna sound a little bit like a broken record saying this, but ipamorelin is not FDA approved. Of course. It was evaluated at one point for growth hormone deficiency and ileus, which is a condition where your GI tract can't move things properly, but it never actually made it past phase two trials because it wasn't even found to be effective. But of course, that doesn't stop the black market of peptides from making wild claims about boosting metabolism, fat loss, and muscle growth. Now, I'm a dietitian, I'm not a doctor or a pharmacist, but as a healthcare professional, I am never going to recommend that you take a drug that hasn't been studied on humans for the benefits that you are hoping to get from it. I'm just not interested in playing lab rat with my health, especially with a powerful pharmaceutical. And these peptides are not without risk. So here are some of my personal concerns when it comes to them. Number one, as we've kind of discussed, a lot of these peptides lack human research and others don't have research that actually back up any of their most exciting claims. And this goes hand in hand with the lack of FDA approval for a lot of peptides, which means they are being used off label. And I don't want to make a blanket statement that, you know, using off label drugs is always bad because it's absolutely not. And my doctors advise me on many medications that are being used off label. It's very common, but it's important to keep in mind that the claims you see on TikTok are pretty much all not backed by any sliver of science. Problem number two with this is that the quality and purity of these peptides can be very questionable. Since a lot of these peptides are not approved for clinical use, folks are often buying them from online black market vendors. And just like the supplement industry, these drugs will be completely 
unregulated without FDA approval or really anyone keeping tabs on things. So there's no way of knowing the quality of the product that you're getting. And obviously this can be a massive concern where the best case scenario is that you basically just got a placebo. And the worst case scenario is that you have a contaminated product that is going to severely harm your health. Then problem number three, which won't affect everyone, but any competitive athlete or people who are in the military should absolutely steer clear of these peptides. And that's because they are held to very strict standards with the substances that they take to protect their health and to prevent cheating. So if this applies to you, always check your regulatory agency's rules before trying anything new. Honestly, I think the emerging research on peptides is looking promising and there are tons of approved peptides that are being used successfully today, including things like insulin and semaglutide, AKA Ozempic, and honestly, so, so many more. But the bottom line here is it is very important to understand the research and the limitations of the peptides we've talked about today. So I always encourage you to speak to your doctor before trying anything new. Well, I hope this video was helpful. And if you are interested in more science backed content with both myself and other experts in their fields, don't miss out on my podcast bite back, but I would love to hear your thoughts on peptides. And if there was any specific peptide that you want me to cover next. And I'll see you next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye.